ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, uh, Alison Forsythe. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Oh, you got a mic I've got a mic on. Um, I think we should just wait. Another 10 minutes of Wayne would be good for my ego. Um, <laughs> Um, we could do that, everyone. So good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Um, some of you I did see yesterday at my uh, more safe sport culture session. Thank you. I've got really great feedback. Um, a few things I want to share before I get going. I obviously do have a presentation for you. Um, Wayne has sort of teed this up, but you're going to hear something that I hope if you haven't heard some of my stuff before will hit you very differently today. Okay. So before I start, I will tell you clearly that in partnership with respect group and coach.ca, um, I believe incredibly strongly in providing every single participant in your organization with online training and education when it has to do with safe sport. And through conversations with Wayne and Lorraine and Sheldon, we also all recognize that this, the issue of safe sport is very complex currently in our safe sport landscape. So if you, my goal here today is to give you some more knowledge, awareness, and understanding of that complexity. I think we all own the Google machine and we're all probably coming into this conversation at a different level of understanding, opinion, potentially judgment, potentially fear, confusion. I'm putting big words towards how you may be feeling right now in this landscape. Um, so I want you to just get grounded in what we're gonna talk about. And one thing that happens to me quite often now because I am in a privileged position of not only speaking to many survivors, working in the space, advocating on boards, helping have set up the initial changes of safe sport and my company of which I wanna be very clear, I have no part in the complaint management that my company does. However, we as a company do manage thousands of independent complaints every year. From that information, what I receive is statistics and knowledge around the types of complaints that are being filed. And so I also wanna ground you in the reality of how you need to start, start to think about your behaviors and where they might be tiptoeing. And I'm not saying any of this is intentional into something that could be construed as maltreatment now, okay? So as we do this, what happens to me now is many people, including someone in this audience is gonna go, but Allison, can I do this or can't I? What's the new rule? And here's the hard part where you're gonna have to dig into your very smart leadership brain is if you were to have to ask me every question about what is now allowed and not allowed, I think you could understand that is not a sustainable approach to creating a healthy, positive, safe sport environment for your participants. So I will tell you about some new rules, but in that, please, please use your discernment as the leader that you are. And your goal is to start to self-educate and become self-aware of what would and would not be accepted in the current safe sport landscape. Two more things, three. One, I want you to know that safe sport is never going away, ever. This is going to become a critical component of our children's and our coaches and our administrators' safety for the rest of time, and we need to celebrate that, okay? So if you are I'm not on the train, you need to get on it or you will be gone. And I do not say that with anything but the utmost respect. This is now a critical component of everything you do in your organization. Second thing is I will provide you with a trigger warning. So what that is, and I highly encourage you whenever you're talking about anything sensitive or talking about abuse that you provide this. So today I will speak about sexual abuse only for about three to four minutes, mindful of re-traumatization of course. And I will be talking about various forms of abuse. So take care of yourself. Mental health finally matters in sport. Um, and that goes the same for you. Then the last thing I'm gonna share, because you might be like, whoa, this woman's kind of already coming at us hot here, is I really, really appreciate what you do and how challenging this is. So please do your very best to step out of personal listening. What do I mean by that? I will use terms like coach. I will use terms like you. And I'm gonna speak at an administrative level today and a coach level, okay? Because I think that's where we're all filing in here. So I will speak to those two groups. I am not talking to you. What's your name? I do like talking to you, Solomon. You're very kind, we chatted last night. But I'm not talking to Solomon, all right? I'm talking about your general group. Now, how do we know this? Research, PhD research, off the hook these days around safe sport. Again, a lot of what I take and bring into these sessions is developed material 
that I have been impacted by, by speaking to many, many, many survivors of abuse in sport and what they have taught me about the commonalities. The other thing I have has the privilege of speaking to many coaches who are now terrified to coach. And that is so frightening because if we keep taking safe sport as an athlete versus organization issue only, and if the narrative keeps being spun, and I'm sorry, some of you might already go onto Twitter and bash me for this, I'm used to it. The narrative cannot be, it's coaches abusing athletes, athletes are never wrong, coaches are always wrong. We are losing coaches by the droves. We are losing referees. We are losing officials. We are losing umpires. And we're losing excellent administrators who are not wanting to come into our sports system based on the crisis and the way people are being treated. So from the bottom of my heart, I, am, I might cry. I'm very real, I'm very raw, and I'm very honest. Please be respectful of that. I don't script myself. I don't do key messages. My mouth will get me in trouble if people want to take it there, okay? You don't need to know what I'm talking about. But please just know this is my passion and my purpose in life. And I'm just so grateful to come into any room, whether there's a few hundred like you or four, and do what I do for your children and for mine. All right? Should I stop there or should I start? <laughs> I'm already clapping. <laughs> and now we'll, uh, oh, maybe my clicker is not working. Sorry, that intro was intense. Okay, so breaking it down, everyone. Here's what we're going to cover today. You're going to hear a little bit more about me, but it's not about me anymore. Um, some of this you'll be like, what? And I want you to be like, what? You may never have obviously heard about the gray zone of safe sport. You probably don't know what the toxic triangle is or the progression of harm. Again, these are materials that I've developed with the help of many people, uh, proprietary materials, so please don't take them. I'm in the process of trademarking them, but this is going to give you the reality of what we're dealing with in sport, all right? In addition to the obvious, which is your policies and your codes of conduct, and I'm going to clearly sh share with you the risks around those. So about me, and this is where things get really real for me, obviously, those are my three little wonderful children. They are in AAA hockey in Oakville, Ontario. Pray for me. Um, <laughs> every day I, I'm obviously in a conflict of interest to do anything with Oakville Rangers and I think they're a good organization but man junior hockey minor hockey still has a lot of work to do the things I see and I'm exposed to wow nothing horrible because I want to talk to you about I'm going to talk to you about microaggressions today and and obviously I'm going to just so you know I will use hockey as an example for some of this okay I love them dearly and I want to protect them Top right hand side of my screen, that's where I was asked to come in as a witness at the House of Commons about six weeks ago. An experience that I thought would be really great. An experience that quickly turned to be not so great. So if you're following what's happening in the parliament right now, I want you to know something that's super clear. It's very divided and that makes me very sad. There are some people that want something and if they don't get it, they're gonna attack the people that want something else. So I save sport at the political level is complicated. People are angry. People are living in their anger and their blame. So my hope for you is don't take sides. There's no sides when it comes to protecting you and your participants. Now the bottom left-hand side of your screen, I always have this slide up there, which Wayne probably didn't even know. That's Sheldon Kennedy, I'm combing the room. When I do this work at colleges, I have to say like, no one, no one knows who I am or him, you know? Um, but he's a bit older, but we all know who Sheldon is, right? Clear, we don't need to go into it. He's incredible. He set the path. I am very honored to even tiptoe into the back of his footsteps and really take this movement to the next level with his and Wayne's support. Bottom of the screen. So I'll talk about sexual abuse for about the next four minutes. These are two incredible friends of mine, teammates, wonderful women. And this picture was taken in 2001 as we were preparing for our first Winter Olympic Games in 2002 in Salt Lake City, Utah. Three years before, I blew the whistle on an egregious sexual abuse that we were suffering under the hands of the same national team coach. It was on the national junior team. All three of us were being sexually abused by this man and none of us knew about each other. Then what ended up happening was there was over 12 of us that when we finally went to our criminal trial were deemed have enough criminal proof, which is very difficult to get, as you can understand. Evidence from the 90s when there was no texting, when there was no digital, right? So we ended up in a criminal trial, but I wanna tell you a few things about what happened before that. So in our case, I'm gonna to talk to you today about the stages of grooming. We were a very classic, and I know how weird that is to hear, a very classic case of predatorial grooming abuse. What this man did was he created 
a over-sexualized environment where he puppeted athletes off each other with extreme favoritism and personal bonds. And he would create it basically, the only way I could explain it is a harem for his own sexual gratification. And I'm sorry, that's hard to hear, but it happens. It happens. When our trial finally happened, we went to a two and a half year criminal trial and investigation in 2007, 2015 to 2017. We were at the exact same time as the Larry Nasser trial out of the US. So from a comparative, the Larry Nasser trial and ours was quite similar um, in the regards of how these, this guy orchestrated his abuse. So yes, I will spend time today talking to you about what your warning signs are and what you need to look for when it comes to predatorial abuse. And I'm not gonna say the word but, I'm gonna say the word and. And I'm actually gonna spend the bulk of my time talking about the other seven forms of maltreatment because they're far more common and they are the forms of maltreatment that we can educate people away from. Nobody in this audience is expected to educate a predator out of being a predator. Your role as an administrator and a coach is to know the warning signs, to shut your door to that person coming into your organization. And if you ever think grooming is happening, you act quickly, swiftly, and very confidently. All right. So in our case, it was overtly covered up by our national sporting organization for fear of losing sponsorships. I was coerced into silence and I went on to ski for 17 years. In those 17 years post, no, sorry, ski for another 10 years post that. Here's what happened. Every single result that Wayne talked about, I got. I won the national championships eight times. I raced exclusively on the World Cup and made a very good living for 10 years. I was a two-time Olympian and a world championship medalist. And the sports system would have looked at that and people have said to me, they said, well, at least you were successful, Allison. What? Okay. This is it. We talked about this yesterday. You do not need to go through abuse and to be who I was. Depressed, chronic PTSD, substance abuse challenges, eating disorder challenges. This was me while I was the best skier in the world. So wrap your head around, please. We're not going to go too far into culture today, but please try on four size that happy, healthy, safe athletes won't only win, they will win more. It is not a either or. I was miserable. I was suffering with extreme mental health challenges, but I was winning. So nobody cared. Nobody even looked. Nobody even asked how I was feeling in 10 years. All right, it was, oh, that's done, let's move on. He was caught by Genevieve, another victim who saw him coaching again. He resurfaced as they do and started coaching young athletes. She, not our system, not our organization, she marched herself into the RCMP dispatch of Mont Tremblant in Quebec and simply said, there's a very bad man back on the hill coaching young kids. I'm gonna tell, him what he, I'm gonna tell you what he did to us. He was arrested, never saw the light of day until he was let out from prison about a year and a half ago because of COVID. And we did, went to trial and it was horrific. I had to testify in court when I had a 24 hour old baby, right? So I had to bring her into court with me. I think any parent here can imagine that in itself was incredibly traumatic and very challenging. I didn't get to enjoy even nearly the first few months of her life. We did it and we're proud to have done it. And it was horrible, but why did we do it? We did it to punish him, sure. That's honestly for all of us, I think we would all say that was just a small part of it. He's a sociopath. You're not going to train him out of being who he is, right? You're not going to reform him in prison. It's not possible, in my opinion, okay? We did it also because we were like, hey, wait a second. The Canadian sports system is going to do something about this now. They can't let this happen to other people. The government's going to do something. Nope. How did it feel to us? And it was just like, oh, we got rid of that. Now we'll just go back to business as usual. So all that being said, and I'm going to move on. Um, we came forward as a group of victims and started, along with excellent people in this audience, a movement towards safe sport in Canada. This was in 2018. Where are we now? I am being very clear and honest, and I work with many national sporting organizations, many provincial sporting organizations. My job is to not sit back and blame. My job, my purpose is to get in to the work on the front lines. And yes, some people may say that because I choose to work with organizations, I'm automatically covering up abuse. I'm not kidding. That's the crazy narrative people are running. Wrong. I go in because I believe people can do better and I believe organizations can do better. And I will tell you clearly, our organizations at every level did a really shit job of putting safe sport in place in the last four years. 
Why? Because of this. I'm gonna to talk to you about the forms of abuse in a second, but I want you to look at the right-hand side of your screen. Our organizations did exactly what they were told to do, which is a sports system in Canada where humans tick the box, where we somehow believe that when we put a policy in place, we've prevented abuse. Find me someone, I dare you, who knows the definitions and examples of the universal code of conduct that's on a national team. Find me them. Find me the coach on the field that now knows why he, she, or they cannot run suicides. And no, you can't. Find me that person. This is why I say they did not do a good job, but I don't blame them, so wait for it. They did exactly what they were told to do. We developed the universal code of conduct for maltreatment in sport that covers off the forms of abuse that you see on the left-hand side of your screen. Our NSOs were mandated by the government to put that in place within the last three years. Sure, they did. They put it on you know, page 62 and to 95 or whatever of their policy suite. Tick, online training. Tick, it's good. I mean, I'm in that one. I, I did well, no kidding. Um, online training is good, it's important, but we have two leaders in online training here that would agree with me. It's not gonna be enough, all right? It's not gonna be enough. You just gotta do that and more, and I know that sucks. I'm also gonna talk to you a little bit about where you might be going in your head, which is like, whew, this is awesome, but she doesn't understand how hard my job is and how hard it is to get volunteers and how hard. Remember, critical, critical part of your organization moving forward. Policies, codes of conduct, background checks and safeguarding hiring measures. EPIC, vulnerable sector, background, do you do them? Yes. Do you catch predators through doing them? No. Do you prevent them from applying for a job with you? Say it, yes. So you prevent them from applying. That is your safeguard from letting these guys in. Sorry, I'm using guys as a pronoun here, okay? But they're not gonna apply. That's what we see as being the reality of the background check, but it is critical. Case management and investigations. I am not going to go through a massive thing about independent complaint management today. I'm not gonna talk about where your organization is sitting, where your club's sitting, what Ontario soccer might be doing, what Canada soccer is doing. What you need to understand is that within one year to a year and a half from now, I would be incredibly surprised if every single one of you wasn't forced or mandated to use independent complaint management. And my goal here, everyone, is I don't want you to ever feel like you're forced to do anything. I want you to understand that you are putting yourself at a massive risk if your club is managing your complaints internally. Because if you have a complainant, not a victim, a complainant, which is someone who's gonna file a complaint and they don't get the outcome that they want, they're gonna turn around immediately and say, she tried to cover it up. That is where we're sitting, okay? That is why my company cannot even keep up with the amount of people that need their managed complaints managed externally from their organization. That is why OSIC exists. It is not because you're all sitting around trying to cover up abuse. It is because you're not experts in it. You're gonna automatically be biased. You're inherent, unconscious, confirmation. You work for an organization. You're a good person, but maybe the guy that's gonna take your role next week is not, okay? So I'm not gonna tell you what to do. Again, I'm not here to force things down your throat. I am gonna tell you get ready because you should not be managing your own complaints. The forms of abuse, I could go through every definition and example, but look up the universal code of conduct for maltreatment in sport, please. You may or may not be held to it, but look it up because there's not only forms, but there's definitions and clear examples. We see a huge problem with bullying and hazing. I do a whole seminar on coaching, um, coaching Gen Z under the Safe Sport landscape, which I developed with uh, Coaching Association of Canada. Amazing, and I can go through that another time for you. But I want you to understand critically that you're dealing with usually Gen Z, which are age 12 to 25. They are a peer-to-peer -peer generation, all right? Never please, and I know I'm coming off really assertive, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna keep going. Stay with me, people, okay? Lots of information, take notes. They are not going to respect authority, they're gonna respect each other. On top of that, they can be very, very mean to each other. Bullying and hazing is out of control, all right? They are not nice to each other. Then you add this little thing called cyber and distribution of child pornography. I went and educated high school athletes last week in Winnipeg, amazing. Sport Manitoba brought in high school athletes. I was like, yes, here we go. Let's get younger and younger and younger. And I didn't just say, you know, sending a picture around of someone is not good. I said it's distribution of child pornography. And their faces went, whoop, 
now I'm listening, right? So when you look at the forms of maltreatment, I want you to think about the reality in your organization, okay? Because what we see likely, I will, like what we see the most of and what the stats have shown is psychological abuse, neglect, and oftentimes neglect is misconstrued. So stay with me here, I need to explain this to you. Neglect is the denial of adequate nutrition, safety measures, and psychological safety for an athlete to be able to compete and train. Neglect is not, I didn't get the same amount of playing time as Bob, okay? However, because we're not doing our job in educating our participants on these forms of maltreatment, you may have someone file a complaint against one of your coaches for neglect because they've been shortened their playing time. That is called a very poor practice called not enrolling anyone in how you shorten your bench. And the other poor practice that you might be doing is called favoritism and personal bond. So if a coach is playing favorites, and we're gonna get to that when I go through the toxic triangle, you might be like confused right now, but when a coach is playing favorites, it does not mean that coach is neglecting someone else. It could mean that that coach is grooming someone though. So this is where we're gonna dance. This is where our intuition and discernment needs to come in. Um, also on the side of the screen under maltreatment, I do wanna talk about suicides, bag skating and hockey. And here's where I'm gonna ask of you again, step outside of yourself, what happened to you as a child that you think wasn't that big of a deal? Step outside of your bias where you could say, but Allison, like I'm not harming a kid by making them run up and down a field 10 times. And I would say, are you sure about that? Because that's you trying to figure out what harm is. When we talk about maltreatment, we talk about it from the perspective. This is where you're gonna learn everyone. The perspective you need to think about is a little thing I like to call concussions. 25 years ago, I'd get knocked unconscious on a ski hill or very darn close. And if I felt okay, I went back up and did another run. Am I gonna file a complaint against my coach from 25 years ago? No. Did my coach 25 years ago know the kind of trauma that my brain was getting every time I got a concussion? No. All this is everyone around psychological abuse specifically is we now know that when we yell, and negatively reinforce and toughen up athletes. We are traumatizing their brains. So I want you to just step into what we now know and when we know better, we do better and step out of, but that's not a big deal. What I will share is that of course, there is gonna be a threshold. You will not get sanctioned for a year by making a kid do 40 push-ups. There, you have to trust the system in that. But your job as an administrator or a coach is simple. Remove any environmental, structural, or decision-making issues that could lead to maltreatment. Running suicides, it progresses. You may say to your coaches, yeah, let's just you know, toughen those kids up because they're Gen Z and they're a bunch of soft kids. Not your business. I don't care. Nobody cares if these kids are soft. If they're soft, they're soft. That's your perception. But if you think your job is to toughen them up, you are wrong. And I'm sorry, you're a good person, but you're wrong. And what it's gonna result in is you getting in trouble, period. And this is just who you are dealing with now. And yes, we could go on for six hours about their parents. You're also dealing with their parents. This is the generation. You're either gonna step into it or you're gonna resist it. And if you resist it, you're gonna get in trouble and it's gonna be a problem for you, all right? So with these forms of maltreatment, I'm gonna give you an example. The example I'm gonna give you is hazing. So hazing is very common as a progression of harm. Where does hazing start? It starts with pranks. Simple, kids are just being kids. Let's make fun of, of John and throw something in a garbage can. Let's hide his ball, okay? So hazing is any ritualistic initiation that kids or anyone has to perform to feel included in a group. Bullying is exclusion. Hazing is you have to do this to be included. All right, I always talk about these things and all of a sudden the thing in Quebec pops up and I'm like, yep, could have told you that one, all right? Now, I'm gonna tell you honestly about one of the leagues that we work with in hockey. So they had a hazing issue, who doesn't, okay? It was a public hazing issue so I can talk about it. We posted it on the website because that's what you need to do. Um, and it started with something called kangaroo courts. So what a kangaroo court is, which is very common in hockey, it's where the intention, and I'm asking you, challenging you to think about your own organization, what could happen in your organization. 
The intention is that athletes provide themselves with self-leadership and independent and their role modeling to each other. So they have these kangaroo courts, which is basically like, well, you are late, so you have to pay $5. Punishing by paying money. They hold these courts and there's like the captain's the judge and makes the decisions. And the leagues are like, wow, this is great. The kids are all taking care of themselves. Wrong. Because then what happens? Hazing happens in these kangaroo courts. So when we worked with this league and people that got pretty defensive because these kangaroo courts have existed for 20, 30 years, I said, yeah, they said, no, it's okay. We're just not gonna allow hazing, but we're still gonna allow kangaroo courts. No, you're not. So you gotta remove the environment that could lead to the maltreatment, okay? So last thing I'll say about the black and white aspects of safe sport, because I'm gonna move on, is that we have a job to do now. You're gonna tick your boxes because that's sport but you're also going to take that policy off the paper and for the love, educate on it and put it into practice. Because when we actually deal with policies is when something bad has already happened and we have to call the person and say, you've had a complaint filed against you under a policy that you didn't even read. Here's what your parents do. They're on their phone at another soccer game and they're trying to scroll through all these gosh darn legal policies that you're making them sign. And they're checking the box. They're not reading them. They're not even reading the parental code of conduct that you're trying to hold them to. True? Who reads it? No one. I work with national teams and I walk into the room and I say, hey, Olympians, best athletes in the world, how many of you have ever read your athlete agreement? Why would we read that? Hmm, okay. And what also happens when we choose not to pay attention to online training is this. Get me out of here, get me out of here, get me out of here. I'm here to tell you that this stuff matters and you need to pay attention for your own protection. All right, we're almost there, but we're not. Hang in there, people. We're doing good. Um, okay, so I just want to share with you a little bit about, sorry, my clicker's being weird. I think I'm pointing it at the screen instead of over here. Gen X coming at you hot, people. Okay, so here's what exists at the safe sport mandates at each level currently. Your national sporting organization, and I will talk about what we're doing with Canada soccer at the end of this presentation in case your brain is already going there. But every national sporting organization must follow the universal code of conduct for maltreatment in sport. They must provide every participant with education and training, and they must use independent complaint management. The number one place for complaints that are now being filed at the national level, which is a good thing, is the Office of the Sport Integrity Commissioner. Is it still being set up and needs time to be successful? Yes. But your national sporting organizations have a direct line now to an independent government-funded agency to manage complaints. All right? PTSO, PTSO levels all over the map. Some PTSOs have their NSOs mandating things down the system. And I hate that word, but they're forcing them to do it instead of enrolling them in it. You know the difference? Just tick the box. And some have that sideways mandate from their government funding agency. Okay, so BC is an example. Via Sport in BC is the same as Sport Canada, is that if you want to get money, you're going to do the following things. Here's what the gap is in all of that is I hope I'm coming across clear now. The gap is that people don't like to be told what to do unless they're enrolled in the why, okay? So I'm gonna use a parent code of conduct as an example. We get often asked for parental codes of conduct. As you can imagine at the club level, it's one of the number one things that clubs want because they wanna get the parents off their back, okay? Two things happens in that. One is I say, great, you can have a parental code of conduct, but I also you're also gonna pay me to enroll your parents and why it matters, educate them on it, and then hopefully you'll never have to enforce it. How does that sound? And they go, oh, well, that sounds even better, Allison, right? I'm not gonna hand you a code of conduct when I know that the sports system goes, scroll, 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 submit, right? You need to pause and take the time. The second thing that needs to happen with parents is you need to be super clear at the outset of the season or the year, how their relationship with your coaches is gonna work. You need to set boundaries with these people. How you do that is you have proactive parent meetings. All the parents understand when the bench gets shortened and why, and you proactively prepare for issues that you think parents can have. So you're not on your back foot all the time in reaction. They're not emailing you every day, all right? So again, it's take that policy off the paper, enroll people in it, and make a choice. Because look at the bottom. Some clubs have to do nothing. So I will tell you again, if you're going to sit around and wait for someone to tell you to do something, you're putting yourself in a very precarious position. So I'm not going to tell you all exactly what you need to do. I am going to tell you clearly from Canada Soccer's point of view, but I also want you to start to think about, again, discernment. This is for your protection and everyone else's. This is a huge slide. I'm going to talk to you about each one of them because they all matter. 
So about, um, I guess it was over a year ago now, I presented the Sageport International Conference. It was in Geneva. I think we all know it was in online Geneva back then. Um, and I was supposed to come as a keynote. And I could have done that today, to be honest. If this was me, Lorraine would say, even three years ago, I would have told you my story for 45 minutes. But I've, once I know better, I do better. And I've learned so much. And then what happened is I, was, they, I said to uh, Dr. Kirby, wonderful um, safe sport advocate, I said, I think I just need one slide instead of telling my story. Can I just do one slide? It took me about five minutes to do this. Here is where your issues are. And this is going to scare you. This is where we're at. Your athletes, you, any participant in sport has a micro environment mentality. Okay. Research has shown that by the time a child is about nine or 10 in a high performance pathway, they start to collapse who they are with what they do. This further perpetrates the I'll, I'll accept anything. So if you think as a coach that when you're yelling at a child on a field, they're going to understand that that's just feedback. If I get yelled at at work as an adult, I don't think it's feedback, it's criticism, right? So when you start to berate a child or yell at a child, again, this is not you, I'm not saying that you're doing this. I'm talking about psychological abuse and you think it's for their own good because you're toughening them up, you're traumatizing them. On top of that, which you heard me say a bit yesterday, if you're in the session, almost 95% of them won't even respond to negative reinforcement anymore. This generation just doesn't. So it's not gonna work. And you're on this hamster wheel of like, well, this is what I think needs to happen, okay? So you gotta focus on the fact that these athletes don't know better, they're going on this pathway and you have a huge responsibility to treat them well because they will put up with stuff because they want to win. Athletes are incredibly vulnerable to abuse. I think we all know why. And I want you to start to resonate on that word vulnerability because I'm gonna get to it again later. Vulnerability is not weakness. Vulnerability is willing to say, I don't have all the answers, help me. All right. I'm going to do a whole slide on the complexity of the coach. Oh, sorry, on the cultural conditioning and the um, normalization of behaviors. Most of you at the club level, and I know some of you have some pretty high performance teams, but you're in what we would consider the pickup drop off stage of safe sport, where the parents are usually still involved. They're dropping the kids off at the field. They're picking the field kids up. As that child goes up the high performance pathway, travel becomes a part of it. The environment changes. I think you all know where I'm going with this. The relationship with their coach is complex. Now, why is that up here? Because it's not fair to not acknowledge that. Because when we ask you to hold boundaries with your athletes, I have the deepest respect that that is a very hard line. Okay, and I'm not afraid to say it because you want that athlete to be a great person. So I could sit up here and tell you that, you know, a holistic athlete approach, finding out who your athlete is, is very critical to sport right now. But then on the other side, I'm going to tell you, but whoa, don't cross that boundary. Don't be their friend. Okay. So I don't have this slide today. Or I think I might, but you are the trusted authority figure for your athlete. And yes, you can have a professional friendship with that athlete. What personal bond becomes a problem is when you're texting and talking to that athlete about pieces of their life. When any of your coaches are following athletes on their social media channels, hard no. Okay this generation will overshare on social. They will share their traumas. They will share their issues. They will vent. That is not your business. And I know you might want it to be, but you need to stay in your lane. That is their parents' business. From a grooming perspective, absolutely not should you be seeing what your 16-year-old your athlete is doing on a Friday night and commenting on her Snapchat about it. Even if it's innocent in your brain, it is incredibly, incredibly a sign of grooming. You need to know that. So I'm trying to protect you. Get off their social channels if you're on them and start to think about what does that boundary look like and how do you hold it, all right? The realistic application of the rule of two. It's excellent. The rule of two developed by Sheldon about boys in dressing rooms with hockey players. Why is it on my gray zone? Because it's not realistic in all settings. And I know that's controversial to say. I'm not saying that the rule of two doesn't matter, which is a coach should never be alone with an underaged athlete. I am saying I want you to open up and start to think about what open, observable, and interruptible spaces looks like. Because when you hand someone a rule, this happened at Rowing Canada, they wouldn't mind me saying this, where they said, well, we're going to follow the rule of two, so a coach is never allowed in a boat with an athlete. And I was like, well, isn't a coach in a boat with an athlete pretty critical sometimes? They're like, yes, but we follow the rule of two, and I don't want to get in trouble, Allison. So they don't like, I walked into that organization, I talked about them a lot yesterday. 
incredible. They've been doing so much work to try to get stronger. But when I walked in, they freaking hated safe sport and I didn't blame them because they were getting handed these rules that didn't make sense. So I created open and observable programming for them. Alpine skiing, my sport. Oh, Allison, we're doing great in safe sport. We never let the coach get on a chairlift with an athlete. Okay. Uh, is it open? Is it observable? You're minimizing your risk. Could an acute sexual interference happen on a chairlift? Yes. However, if you have everyone hating safe sport and thinking it's a joke because of this stupid rule, you see that? They're not going to take it seriously. Here's what you're watching for. In my sport, I say to clubs, use your discernment. You're not policing a coach getting on a chair with an athlete. You are policing that same coach getting on the same, with the same athlete getting on the chair all the time. You see the difference? That's the grooming. It's not an acute situation. It's incredibly rare for a predator to just do something once. The grooming is what you need to catch, which is a coach spending way too much time with the same athlete, driving the athlete around. So now why do I want you to think about the rule of two? Because it could look like it's villainizing you. So I'll give you the example. I apologize. I think I gave this yesterday. You're driving down a road and your job is to drive Sally home every day. And people are getting smart to grooming and abuse. And one of the moms from Sally's school drives by you this way and goes, oh, why is little 11 year old Sally in the car with a man, okay? Or you're in, you're in a school gym. And I do this at universities because I had a university say to me, but Allison, like I wanna be available to my athletes in the morning in the gym for extra reps. It was a college basketball team. And I say, okay, well, what, is it open and observable? Yes. I said, well, what risk do you see, right? Use discernment. I said, I'll tell you what I see. I said, does every single athlete on the team know that that's an opportunity for them? And he's like, oh, I don't know. And I said, that's your first problem. Because if coach John and athlete Sue are together in the gym every single morning by themselves and other people are walking back and forth, they're gonna start to wonder why they're spending so much time together, right? So when you are even in open observable spaces, you need to be very clear um, with how that's gonna go. Okay, I'm gonna pick it up here, I promise. Hiring the guy with their values, not yours. Watch out. You need to start, please everyone. And I know I'm being ah, hardcore here. You need to start to think about your best coach is not the one that wins the most championships. When we define best based only on success and we don't look at culture that we want to create, the socio-emotional side of coaching, how they're treating the athletes, this to me, and this is me, my brain, I think this is the biggest freaking problem we have in sport where we hire, and that might be you, and I apologize because I know you're a good person. You might be the best coach that they've ever seen in your club. But if you come in all guns a-blazing and it's your way or the highway, and we're going to now do it like Coach Bob because there's no culture here, and Coach Bob's coming in from another country, so now we're going to not only do it like Coach Bob wants to do it, but we're going to do it like Italy wants to do it, and whatever works in Italy is going to work here? Absolutely not. We create our culture in Canada while sport matters and what it is, and then you take that to your club level and you hire for that. And again, you're gonna have to have faith and trust as we shift this system. And again, remember that athletes who are happy and healthy and treated well will still win, okay? Governance risks like sole discretionary decision-making. Again, if you have the guy, this is what you see all the time. Everyone, there's reports. The public cases are out there, read them. Lack of oversight is something that you will see consistently. The guy comes in, no one watches him. Administrators don't police his behavior because they just are like, well, Bob's here to win, okay? On top of that, Bob makes all the freaking decisions. So what do you think an athlete wants to do? Solomon, what does an athlete want to do when Bob makes all the decisions? The athlete wants to please Bob. You know where I'm going with that, right? Objectivity for selections. Microaggressions and boundary transgressions, I'm gonna go through that in a second. We don't want to report. And when I say we, I say you as well. Every single one of you wants to go up probably in your organization. You want to get a job somewhere else. You don't want to rock the boat. The time is done for not rocking the boat. All right. We need to protect ourselves. And I'm not going to skip past it, but the progression of harm is important. But I want you also to understand that I believe, I, again, I have nothing to do with our complaints, but I believe we rarely see frivolous or malicious complaints filed in safe sport. If you are a coach right now that is fearful that a false complaint could be filed against you, I do not, I do not judge you for that. I do think that is possible. 
Why do I think that's possible? Because we're not educating our athletes on maltreatment properly. And an athlete could say, well, my coach yelled at me once and I'm filing a complaint. Okay. If your coaches are yelling and screaming at athletes, that are my, that is probably could be abuse, but it's also likely a cultural microaggression situation that you need to shut down. We cannot have every single little thing going to a complaint. All right. You don't want to deal with that. The progression of harm. I'm going to use hockey as an example here. Wow. Look at the second from the top. Okay. We all know, regardless of everything, we know what happened in the hotel room with Hockey Canada. Second from the top. There's things I hear from people in the industry right now that if it's not sexual assault, I don't have time for it. The US Center for Safe Sport has such huge issues with sexual assault, they can't even handle anything else as far as I know, okay? Sexual assault, sexual assault, sexual assault. So we could sit here and say, oh my gosh, we have this massive problem with sexual assault. And if we did, we're not wrong, but then we're plucking off case by case and issue by issue at the second to the top of the pyramid of harm. Now look at the bottom. This is why you can never, I'm sorry, you can never fight against equity, diversity, inclusivity, and accessibility. Your culture lives at the bottom. Your inclusion, your open and transparent communication, your pathways for filing complaints, your safe sport on every board meeting agenda. The culture you create is how you're gonna prevent people from going up that progression of harm. Ready for it? I hope this hits home. We currently take a nine-year-old white hockey player and we say, whoa, what's up next, Connor McDavid? You're coming with us. We're gonna give you a belief in your superiority. We're gonna take you out of regular society. You're not gonna see inclusivity. We're gonna protect you. We're gonna send you up the pathway towards the NHL. You're gonna be around other kids that look like you, have an affluence level like you, and you're special. We're gonna take you to unsanctioned tournaments. You're gonna play up. We all know this, I'm sure it happens in soccer too. You know where else we're sending them? Where else are we sending that guy? We're sending him up the pathway to the NHL and we're sending him up what? You got this, the progression of harm. <laughs> we're sending, they all got it for you, you're welcome. That's, He's like, did I seriously sit in the front row? Um, does that make sense, everyone? So I'm sorry, I'm gonna be real. I'm raising two young, very good hockey players. And if I let them, they would have done this with my boys. Okay, Elite Academy is this and that. If you have that going on, it's not wrong, but make sure there is still a massive fun, community, inclusivity, right? You do not have to be treated overly special and protected to go up the pathway. Find me one of those kids' moms that would ever have thought their son was capable of that. But we don't want to blame ourselves. And I'm not blaming you. I'm blaming all of us for not focusing where we need to focus. Your job is at the bottom and the next one up. Microaggressions, jokes, taunts, lack of inclusivity, exclusivity, the joking in the dressing room, whatever is happening, stop it. Because you're going to just keep sending people up and it gets worse and worse. The toxic triangle. I don't do very good PowerPoints, as you can tell. It's like PowerPoint 101. Um, but here we go. This is the last big kahuna, so I know this has been a lot. Favoritism, personal bond, isolation, and complicity. Four stages, it's the recipe of grooming. A predator, again, I'm going back to predatorial abuse. They will play favorites. They will be the coach. This is, I'm gonna talk about me because it'll be relevant. He played absolute favorites. If you were his favorites, he coached you more. You were spending time at his house in the summer. You were his girl, okay? Then the, he tiptoed into quite quickly into asking about boyfriends, girlfriends. Remember, he'd already created this overly sexualized environment where that was normalized for us. So suddenly it was not only that I was his favorite, but he was now my best friend and my confidant and wanted to tell me all about his problems with his girlfriend and wanted to know all about the problems with my boyfriend. All right? So at that point, I was hooked. Then comes mental or physical isolation. We have the rule of two for the physical isolation part, but we cannot lose track of mental isolation. So in our case, and this is, to, for years, this was embarrassing for me, but now, I'm, now I totally understand it. There was five of us being sexually abused by the same man out of 10. And none of us knew of each other. Because when I blew the whistle in our case, I disclosed to a female physical therapist and she started crying and I said, I get it. Like you're showing empathy. She said, no. Another athlete was in here five minutes ago and told me the same thing was happening to her. And when I found out who that athlete was, he had told me such horrible things about her 
that I knew who all the other victims were because they were all the girls he spoke so horribly about. So they isolate, okay? I don't work on complaints. I do work on figuring out if this is happening in organizations. If you have a coach who is isolating parents from talking to each other, from kids talking to each other, red flag. Does that make sense? That's mental isolation. They do not want to find you to find them out. Here's who else they are. They're Ted Bundy. Does anybody watch the Ted Bundy files on Netflix? Okay. Or the Ted Bundy tapes? You are looking for the person you least expect. Ted Bundy was a white Anglo-Saxon male in the 70s who's charismatic, good-looking, super popular, um, training to be a lawyer or was a lawyer, all right? Even when he was sentenced to death or life in prison, whatever his final sentence was, the judge, judge like apologized to him while he was doing it. He said, sorry, partner, I hate to do this to you, okay? So that's bias meets nobody would ever think that that guy was murdering women. What I hear all the time is, but Allison, he's, she's, the, the assistant general manager now, they are, they're, they're volunteering in the community. They're um, on all the committees. These are your people. Isn't that fascinating in a way? We still look to the last person that we, we look to the person we expected to be based on what we think. It's not a guy in 1990s with a white van pulling up next to a playground, which by the way, was also a me media fueled bullshit, okay? It is the person in your organization or someone you know who is gonna be the last person you expect based on their personality and what do they do? They groom you, it's called grooming the gatekeepers. They will groom everyone around you to find access to that child or to that athlete. Okay, back to the top. He, I'm using he as a pronoun here. He will jockey these athletes off each other, right? He will not want them to play well as a team because he's playing favorites. And when he, it happened to us, when I got away from him, I'll, I'm always very honest. How did I get away from him? Because you could all sit here and you're biased and please don't, please appreciate that in me. Your bias could be telling you right now, why didn't she just get on a plane and go home? I had someone come up to me after the Kyle Beach case and said, I just don't get it. Why didn't he just walk out of the room? And then people would light up on Twitter. Well, why didn't Kyle Beach just walk out of the room? Why didn't Allison Forsyth just get on a plane? I'm not gonna tell you why, just know you don't know. If you haven't had that experience of mental coercion and sexual coercion, you don't know. So please just step in. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure she had a good reason for not getting on the plane, right? So again, step out of your bias. But what I will share is I got away from him mentally and I started to ignore him and he started to ignore me, okay? Because that's how it works. And then what do you think he did? Pick the next one. And I saw it happening and I knew it was happening and that's why I disclosed finally. And that's what we see incredibly common when it comes to abuse in sport of that level of predatorial behavior is that athletes or any participant won't say something until it starts to happen to someone else. They'll take it. What do they do in universities? They move schools. What do they do in clubs? They move clubs. We can't move countries at the national team. So we were even more stuck, okay? But you'll see, we're starting to look at girls particularly that are transferring to different universities for sport on compassionate appeals and asking that critical question, like why is she going, right? What's so bad here that she doesn't wanna stay? So all this to be said, even if, and I really hope not that this is an abusive individual, who is trying to do this, create the toxic triangle of abuse, it goes deeper than that, which is the simple toxicity it creates and that level of individualism within a team that keeps your teams from playing together and succeeding together. The number one athlete that's gonna get bullied on the team is gonna be the one that's the coach's favorite. And then second one is the one that the coach talks horribly about. And it usually happens by name. Oh, why is Elliot on this team? Oh, who picked Elliot? And I'm like, you did, okay? You pick your team at the beginning of the year. So stop calling Elliot out because he's playing badly, right? That's the spectrum. Equitable treatment of athletes is hard, but it is critical to protect yourselves and to be able to know what is actually happening and have a positive environment. Okay, so what now? With Canada soccer, and I know we're Canada soccer, Ontario soccer, it's all over the place. By the end of March, we will be making a major announcement about how all of this will affect you but essentially what you wanna know right now is we're getting independent complaint management lined up. You will have a systemic policy suite that no, you will not have to create or do a ton of work on. We have created what we consider to be a gold standard ironclad policy around safe sport that we're gonna systemically disseminate right down to the club level. The ultimate goal is Canada soccer from the NSO level to the club level is set up for success as best to our ability from a protection standpoint in Canada soccer. It's my goal because I work with a lot of the EDs at the provinces 
my goal, because I'm very, very mindful of how much work you have to do, this does not become a make work project that you have to do more. Dave is exceptional. Jason is exceptional. Get used to it. Okay. Right, Dave? Get used to it. When I say get used to it, you will have minimum standards that your volunteer coaches have to do. And yes, we will make them as easy as possible. We're going to keep reviewing this. I hope you probably know now me on a webinar with, for 20 minutes with your coaches is going to be pretty rad. Okay. So we will be setting up continued education where all of you can come on and go to a webinar. We can dig into this stuff, but just know you're going to be supported. Know that we are very, very intent. And I would not have taken this role if anyone ever that I ever talked to at this organization were to say, well, Allison, we're just going to talk the talk and not walk the walk. So we are committed and you need to be patient because there's a lot to work out. But I want you to know that my goal is that you're supported. You will have to do things and I want you to suck it up and get it done because it's for your own protection and for your participants. In the meantime, and as we're doing that work, we also, I know at the bottom, you're probably always going to, whoa, public registry. It's happening, okay? Right now, your provinces have a mandate that any sanctioned coach needs to be reported to Canada Soccer. Why have we not created a public registry of sanctioned offenders yet? It's simple. Because we haven't set up a system where we can accurately trust that all of those complaints were ran properly with due process. With respect to the respondent. Does that make sense? Okay. So when you're having complaints ran by a bunch of different people in a bunch of different ways, obviously in fairness to a respondent that maybe got sanctioned who actually didn't do anything, we're not going to put that person's name on the website. But within the few, next few months, it will be. Anything you want to add, Dave? Not to put you on the spot. He's like, nope, got it. Um, so in the meantime, friends, and then I'm done, and I'm sorry, I'm probably late. Are we good? One minute. John, Jason, I'm done. Okay. Um, culture, 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 culture. It's not mission, vision, and values on the website. It's putting your behaviors, your attitudes, and beliefs in practice. Your teams are creating little values. What does trust mean? What does respect mean? What does accountability mean? They're just words on a website or they're actionable things in your club every day. Training and education. Do what you're being asked to do and then do more. This is not going away. You're doing what you're asked to do and then you're doing more. How is that simple? It's a conversation. You need to have Safe Sport webpage on your site. The other thing that's going to happen very, very soon, and it's already happening in a sport like gymnastics, is parents are not entering their kids in it anymore. You do not want that to happen to soccer. You need to stand forward and positively encourage people to come forward. Okay, that's the other thing that was very difficult for organizations to grasp is to actually step into celebrating complaints. Celebrate them. Canada is one of the world's leaders in safe sport. Boggling, I know. I could ask Solomon again, but he's gone. Um, <laughs> Solomon, Solomon's gone. I actually didn't know until I just did that. That was kind of funny. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, poor Solomon, he's probably in the bathroom being like, what's happening out there? Um, is we are actually tackling the issue. And one of the most critical steps to tackling a massive issue like maltreatment in sport that has been systemic in sport for over 100 years is to expose it, celebrate people coming forward at the same time that we're working on prevention. But I have all the empathy in the world that when these NSOs or any organization were told to do the following things, their bias naturally being an organization would be like, whew, we're gonna look pretty bad if we have a lot of complaints come out, okay? So you gotta step into it and celebrate people coming forward while you're working on your prevention strategies. And then you need to educate and proactively communicate the complaint process within your club or anything to do with safe sport. I will start to show up. No, I won't imagine. Allison's here. She's going to ask players. Um, um, I might. That might be fun. But it, you have to ask yourself, if Allison showed up on my field a month from now and walked up to a 15-year-old girl and said, hey, have you heard anything about safe sport here? And do you know what to do if you ever see or experience something that doesn't make you feel good? If her answer is no, you haven't done your job. This is the thing that we see. These things are created in boardrooms and they're not created on the field. My challenge, she was start on the field and then take it to the boardroom. Can you do that? Everyone needs to know. Wow, the applause started before. That's it. Thank you. So again, I am who I am. I've stepped into a, level, a new level of vulnerability with the way I educate. So I thank you dearly for letting me be that assertive person for you today. Please step into your vulnerability around this. We're all learning. We're all trying to do better. Those are my social handles. Please reach out. Every Friday, I reserve the whole day 
for free Fridays, I call it, which is just if any of you wanted to book in for a conversation about your club, something that came up for you, a confidential conversation, Fridays, I legit do that all day, okay? And that's also so you know how I learn. Through all of your feedback, your pushback, your challenges, and what you're dealing with every day, it's how I then up my education to take this everywhere else I go. Thank you very much.